Welcome everybody. We're gonna get started in just a minute. Just a few quick housekeeping before we get started. Uh, we've muted everybody just to reduce background noise. Uh, you're welcome to turn off your video if you'd like. It can help improve bandwidth if you're having trouble um, with your internet. We also recommend watching the program in speaker view. And the chat is open. Feel free to submit questions and we'll be sure to answer them either during the program or at the end, there'll be time for Allison to, to do a Q&A. I also just have a few quick announcements. Um, on November 10th, that's this Wednesday at 7 p.m., uh, Lincoln Land Conservation Trust is is continuing our participation in this great local collaboration with five other Lincoln-based organizations um, called the On Belonging in Nature, On Belonging in Outdoor Spaces uh, speaker series. So if you haven't already registered for that, um, you can head over to our website and check it out. And we hope to see you on Wednesday night. Um, also upcoming next Monday, November 15th, um, Several LLCT trustees have organized a great conversation with um, Senator Mike Barrett. So Mike will give a short presentation and then there will be a lot of time for, for questions, answers. And that's about the recent climate change legislation that was passed and um, how citizens can get involved. And then lastly, on November 17th, that's a Wednesday, also at 7 p.m., uh, LLCT and the Lincoln Conservation Commission, Lincoln Conservation Department are going to co-host a public trail forum. And that's an opportunity to give some general feedback um, in advance of an update to the trail guidelines in town. Um, so we encourage everyone to attend that program or submit comments via email in advance of the forum. Um, so I think we're going to get started now. Again, for those who are just joining, uh, we have muted everybody, uh, but you're welcome to submit questions via the chat. Um, so I'd like to now turn it over to LLCT trustee Gwen Loud to introduce our speaker this afternoon. Gwen? Yes. Um, it gives me great pleasure to introduce Allison Field Juma. Um, Allison has been um, involved on the staff of ORS, which is um, the watershed organization for uh, Sudbury, Assabet, and Concord rivers. And you can um, read more about her um, impressive credentials. I heard her speak um, a couple of years ago. And uh, she was speaking in Acton, and her fo her main focus at that time was the Assabet River, which particularly affected Acton. But um, I could tell what a wonderful speaker she was, very engaging, very knowledgeable about sort of the, the wider issues of our watersheds in this area. Um, so uh, it's my great pleasure to introduce her. She's the executive director of ORS, and um, I know we are in for a very informative time. Thank you, Allison. It's all yours. Allison, feel free to share your screen and get started whenever you're ready. And you're still muted, Allison, just so you know. <laughs> There we go. There, is that better? Yep. 
Good, thank you. Sorry, everybody. Thank you so much for inviting me. Um, this is a real treat to talk to all of you. I wish I was talking, to, speaking in Lincoln, but um, someday soon we can do that. But it is, uh, it's really nice to be able to get local and share with you what we've been working on. And I would be fascinated to hear what you find interesting, uh, what you'd like to learn more about, um, about our rivers. So I'm going to talk a bit about uh, a process that we went through, which was developing a river report card. And the purpose of that was that we do a lot of science. That's a lot of what we do. And we do what we call science-based advocacy. So basically, we see there's a problem, we figure out, uh, we, do, we do monitoring, we get collect data, we figure out, well, what is the cause of that problem? And then we advocate for solutions uh, based on the data and also based on working with our communities and what their values are. We also do river-based recreation and education, particularly, particularly of children during the summer through our water-wise workshops. So um, I think you, actually that star is not in the right place. <laughs> My apologies, it should be on Lincoln over to the right. Um, I think you can see on the right Fairhaven Bay. Um, and uh, as you know, we have a river system. It's two rivers that start uh, in Westboro. Both of them start in Westboro, ironically. One heads north uh, in a slightly shorter path to Concord and the other one heads north through a slightly more gentle path uh, to Concord and that's the Sudbury. They converge in, in Concord, they head to Lowell where they join the Merrimack River. And we're really part of a very big system, as you can see, probably you're familiar with the White Mountains. Um, that's where it all begins. And we are basically, if you're a fish coming from the ocean, we are the second left uh, as you come up the Merrimack River. Uh, first left is the Shawsheen, uh, the second left is the Concord River. And so we're very interested in restoring the migration of fish uh, from the Atlantic Ocean up into our rivers as it used to be done a long, long time ago. So speaking of a long, long time ago, uh, this is uh, National Native American Heritage Month, and I think it's suitable to talk a little bit about this watershed from the, the beginnings of human recollection. Uh, of course, history is uh, not always completely clear about who lived where, but we do know that uh, this part of um, our area, I put the red circle around it, was pretty probably pretty much in the, the Massachusetts, land, Pawtucket land, um, but we're also near the border of the Nipmuc um, to the west. So uh, presumably this was an area where people were moving around quite a lot and, and work, you know, communicating and trading with each other. Um, but that is uh, where, where we are. And it's just if you're ever, now you know, if you text this number and you put your town and your state in, they will tell you who lived there uh, early on um, but I, you already know the answer for, for Lincoln if you put it in, because I put it right there. But if wherever you are in the country, you can just type it in. It's, it's, it's a wonderful thing done by the, um, a, a, an organization in, in Canada. So the Nipmuc, uh, who would be to our west, um, lived, uh, you know, there were, there were many different tribes, uh, small bands, um, and they, along with the, the Penacook, who included the folks who would be um, living in the Lincoln area, uh, they lived off of the rivers to a large degree. The rivers provided a tremendous amount of food. The fish uh, was plentiful. The shellfish, the migratory fish, the local fish were, were, were renowned in their plenty. They also use the rivers for transportation. And as you could see from the map, they could get to the, they could get to the ocean uh, down our rivers. So they were very key to the local economies and cultures in those days. 
This is another map that's a little clearer on that delineation, but I don't know that it was, it's any more accurate than the one that I showed you before. But at any rate, that's where we are. So that's where we are. And uh, we undertook uh, a, a project to be able to try to communicate about the state of our rivers more clearly to the public. We do, as I mentioned, a lot of science, but we needed to find better ways to communicate what the results were to our communities. And so we looked around and we determined there was a good way of um, doing this that had been developed by folks at the uh, University of Maryland. And they were doing it on various rivers throughout the world. And these are some very iconic uh, river systems that you may have heard of, like the Orinoco or um, Chesapeake Bay, heard of that one, and um, the Great Barrier Reef. Anyway, we are just the you know, little, little folks uh, right there. And they were actually pretty interested in working with us because we were the littlest one they'd worked with. And they were really interested in getting hyper-local. Uh, and so we uh, worked with them a couple of years ago. And our project was to develop a river report card. And the reason for doing that is, you know, as I said, to communicate better. But also one of the ways it communicates is that the press picks it up. And so we have here from 1996, uh, press release, a news uh, item about the EPA giving the Charles River a barely passing grade of D. Um, and then by 2017, the uh, Conquer, the Charles River has shown tremendous improvement and earned an A minus. So that really grabbed people's attention. It started a lot of discussion about how do we improve the river? What needs to be done? So then not always improving here, the Charles dropped to a B. So that raised the question, what happened? Why, what can we do about that? It gets people involved. Here's the Mystic River also had a grade. It finally made a grade of A minus. Fantastic, because it was really doing badly before. But when they decided to break that down, you could see some bits had, were in the A's and some bits were getting F's. And so that really highlighted where some of the problems were. And uh, it really kind of lit a fire under people in Belmont um, to start to clean up their bit of the, their contributions to the Mystic River. So we developed a report card. It was a long process. I'm gonna tell you a little bit about it. Um, and uh, we have a website that uh, includes it and I'll go show you a little bit more about that. This is what you see at the lower half is the, uh, the results of that first report card. So this is basically the approach we took was very different from the Mystic and the Charles. The Mystic just measured one thing, bacteria. That's all their um, grades based on. We didn't even have any data on bacteria. So our, ours is based on very different things. And it was really to try to get at, it's a much fuller picture and that makes it more complex, makes it more difficult. But we decided that was actually more useful. So it includes all sorts of social, cultural, economic issues, um, good data, it synthesizes it. It was very stakeholder driven in terms of what did people want to have measured and hopefully it provides some kind of a common vision. So uh, it's also in various forms. So there's basic data, scientific literature, all the way up to a very simple one page report card that people who don't have a lot of time uh, can read, and that's particularly useful for influencing public policy. And what we did in short was we looked at what are the threats to our basin? How do we measure those threats? What are things are we going to measure? How do we decide what's healthy and what isn't healthy? And how do we create that and turn that into grades and then, and then communicate it, which is of course ultimately the goal. So we've done all these things and we continue to communicate and here are people, lots of people hard at work. We had a whole big group of stakeholders from all our communities um, and we involved in, in looking at the big picture all the way down to the little picture of what people valued down right down to the indicators. So what we came for the first cut of what people valued about the rivers 
uh, water quality and quantity, habitat for wildlife, public health and safety, cultural and scenic values, uh, recreational value and value to the economy. And under uh, all of this we know is affected by climate change. So we started the process, we did some trials. This is a, as you can see a very, uh, this was a very complex and engaging map about what people saw as the threats and the, uh, and the um, yeah, this is really about what are the, the features and the threats in the watershed. We tried to figure out what to measure. You can see that was quite a process. What did, what were the obvious things? And then, oh, but maybe that doesn't really belong in that category. Oh, that one's impossible to measure. Uh, so we, we moved them around until we came up with something that we were pretty satisfied with about, which was water quality, water quantity, habitat and wildlife, recreation, economy, and culture and scenic values. And this was another trial run, see how it worked. And we also said, okay, well, these aren't just numbers. These are real, these are things that are come from people's hearts. So we asked people to really write much more comprehensive statements about what they valued. And I think it was just, this was a lovely one of scenic. This was a, is a compilation of several of them. The scenery of rivers provides joy and serenity in our hectic lives. This is available to everyone for free and should be available to future generations. It changes constantly, especially with the seasons from subtle to dramatic, always something new to inspire us. So then this, we got into grading, you know, people, people understand grades. We've all had grades since we were little, little tiny people, right? We know what an A is, we know what an F is. And so then we, worked really hard, we measured a lot of stuff. And this is the, all, this is the final spreadsheet. This sort of shows what, all the bits we worked through and how we were coming up with the grades. And I'm gonna go into this in a little more detail in a minute. So don't worry, no, no test here. Um, and it is all spelled out in a methods report that's on the website if you actually want to know how we did the details. And also, so the next people coming along can do it the same way. So I was wondering if people had any questions at this point. I don't know if there are any in the chat um, or whether Feel free I should... to type them into the chat if anyone has questions. Sorry? Just encouraging people to type into the okay. chat if they have questions while, while you're talking. Okay, I think then I'll, I'll continue. Take a breath, all right. So here's the report card that we came up with. We did it as a wagon wheel. We actually called it a beer coaster, but some, you know, I don't know. It depends on what you want to call it. We actually got some beer coasters made, but we haven't, then we weren't able to drink beer because of, of the of COVID. So we've got a lot of beer coasters. Anyway, um, here is the uh, a summation of all of the indicators that we looked at. And I'm going to just look quickly at each one. First of all, we looked at water quality. That's kind of, that's been, that's the thing we've been doing for 20 years is measuring water quality. So we have really good data um, on the aquatic plant growth, dissolved oxygen, suspended solids, temperature, nitrates, and phosphorus, those two last ones being the main nutrients which cause problems. We've been studying this in the acid for a long time, less, a long time in the Sudbury River, but still we've got quite a few years of data for the Sudbury, uh, for the lower Sudbury. Uh, oh, sorry, I'm clicking the wrong thing. Next one was uh, stream flow. So this is, of course, is key. How much water is there going to be in the, in the river? And we looked at different ways to measure that. Some was groundwater levels. There are a few monitoring wells in the watershed, particularly one in Acton is the main one we use. It's only one, only one but there's not very many. Uh, we measured how it is altered from how it probably normally naturally would have been. And we use the Squanacook as sort of a, a less altered stream and compared various qualities to see how, how in a sense natural is, is, is the flow in the river. And then we looked at the area of really of main concern for, for ecologically is the this, this stream flow in the summer um, of how low does it get. Next one was scenery. 
this was a this was a new one to us. Uh, but luckily, the National Park Service had a methodology they've been developing, they've been using in the national parks, and they were really interested in applying it to rivers. So we were game, and we did it, and we. Um, we measured, we picked sites all along the rivers, and we use a very careful uh, system of ranking what we saw in ways that I never would have even considered as being, you know, scenery or in a way of evaluating numerically beauty in a sense, right? So that was, we had lots of questions about that, lots of debates, but we were, we were pretty happy with it in the end, and we came up with those grades. Then we had habitat, and here we're looking at, you know, how healthy is this habitat for aquatic life? Is there connectivity? Do fish get stuck? They can't get to where they need to breed or where they need to sh shelter when there's heat. Uh, that connectivity is very important. You probably know all about that, especially for habitat connectivity. You probably think about that in terms of what land to protect. And of course, all that land has little streams on it, little vernal pools, groundwater, the land and the water connect in that way too. Um, ecological integrity is, compiles a lot of measures. And then impervious cover, which is basically roofs and pavement and things that water, you know, water doesn't go through impervious cover. And that has been shown to be very tightly connected with water quality. So that was an important one to do. And then lastly was recreation. Uh, blockages, are there dams in the way? Can you get there? Is there a boat launch? Um, trails along the river? So there's many ways to enjoy a river. You can enjoy a river by walking along it just as well as you can in a boat. So we looked at trails within 200 feet of the river. Uh, bacteria, we didn't have the data yet. And then fish edibility, which is a um, done by the State uh, Department of Health in terms of fish consumption advisories. And in our river, mercury is the only one that they evaluate for fish consumption. So this is all on our webs on this particular website. Uh, and you can just click on a value and it will show the colors for the six river segments, upper lower of each river. Or you can even click on an indicator like temperature and see it, it will, the map will change. And so you can see uh, which, which bits are doing well and which bits are not doing well. So here's the overall uh, final score and it got a B, which is, uh, you know, could do better, not bad though. Um, but interestingly, it was centered on the bit of our rivers here near the confluence, which is actually the Wild and Scenic River, um, de federally designated Wild and Scenic River, and the ends for various reasons, fared a little bit worse. <coughs> Excuse me. So that's the wild and scenic which you are in. So here we have, for example, the upper, I'm just gonna really look at the upper, at the Sudbury River. Um, uh, we, this doesn't look too good, does it? We, we didn't have a lot of data. So we didn't have the whole water quality monitoring. We didn't have bacteria. We hadn't done the scenery. Um, so there wasn't a lot to go on here, but there were some bits. Fish edibility was really bad because of the Superfund site in Ashland that contaminated the river with mercury. So you absolutely cannot eat the fish in the upper Sudbury. Um, summer stream flow was, was pretty good. Um, so stream flow and habitat were pretty good, but we didn't have a lot to go on here. I'm happy to tell you that this coming summer, we are starting up measuring all of the water quality parameters in the upper Sudbury River. And over the last two years, we have actually started a bacteria monitoring program and we have all that data now. And a year ago, we did the first um, scenic assessment. So we've now got the upper Sudbury River covered. So this is just a little bit to show you how we were, now I've got Lincoln in the right place. Um, how we did this. So for example, which may be of interest to folks who, who, who uh, like to boat, uh, we looked at say the upper Sudbury, how many river miles, how many dams, the mile average miles between a dam. So in the upper Sudbury, it was only one and a half miles between each dam, whereas in the lower Sudbury where you are, 
it was 11 miles, so that's a lot better. In fact, there are no dens um, in, the, in the lower Sudbury. Um, so, well, no, that's not true. There were two, but they're up, up near Framingham. Um, so it, so the lower Sudbury got a very good grade for passability. So here is the lower Sudbury, and this is what you got. Uh, and we are gonna be issuing in December, the next river report card. So we're doing it every two years. And um, the next one is gonna be based on the year, the data from last year and the year before, but mainly the last year, we'll discuss the year before. And it's quite, you will, I'm not giving any secrets away, but it's kind of different. Um, things have changed. Some of them are, they're not, you're not able to see long-term changes yet. That will take years. But you can see the impact, for example, of the drought um, that we had in 2020. And um, that changes a lot of things, uh, and as well as some other things that showed some progress. But at any rate, for the lower Sudbury River, the stream, the low flow, when there's low, lowest flows in the river, are far lower than would naturally be there. And because you have low flow, you end up with low dissolved oxygen, which is, means there's less oxygen for the fish to breathe. So they can suffocate and we can get, um, we can get fish kills. And there's also a lot of wetlands and that exacerbates that problem. The wetlands are great, but they do bring that problem. There's not very much wastewater pollution, so that's great. And there's very few dams, so that's fantastic. Uh, but still, there's huge problems with the fish really are still badly contaminated with mercury and nobody but nobody should eat them. There are also relatively few trails along the river, but that's partly a function of Great Meadows National Wildlife Refuge, which has a lot of um, button bush wetland. It's just not very easy to make trails through there. So that's that's one reason. But there's also uh, great trails in Lincoln um, and there's also beautiful, beautiful scenery. So some of the issues for the lower Sudbury, uh, now 2016, which was a really serious drought, you may recall, um, it was worse than we had in 2020. Um, there was a cyanobacteria outbreak, which you can see this glorious picture. It's kind of noticeable stuff. It's super green and it's, um, it's usually toxic. Sometimes the, 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 back, the, the cyanobacteria don't release their toxins, but they usually do and it, it's very harmful, say if a pet drinks it, it can kill a dog. Uh, if you swim in it, you're gonna itch like mad. Uh, it's really nasty stuff. So this is something that's becoming much more common. Lots of our uh, ponds that you probably saw in the news this, this last year had cyanobacteria problems. Um, a lot of it's because of too many nutrients in the water. And there are lots of different causes for that, including people's lawns, geese, um, septic systems that aren't working properly, lots of reasons. Uh, invasive aquatic plants, we've worked a lot with Lincoln. Um, Lincoln's conservation department and their interns and volunteers have been fantastic. Maybe some of you have been out there pulling out water chestnut. Fairhaven Bay was one mass of water chestnut years not so long ago. And by now it's, we, it can be managed just from some kayaks, pulling it out. It's really great progress, but it will just revert to its former state unless we keep it up. So the, the town's conservation department works really hard on that, collaborating with Concords and the Concord Land Conservation Trust, collaborating because you share Fairhaven Bay and also Concords Natural Resources kicking in some staff. And then our, we have hired um, a team for the last six years to pull water chestnut. And so they joined in this year. It was really a great team effort. Um, so what you end up though with a, such a stagnant situation is you end up with fish that are kind of adapted to that. Pond fish like bass are pretty happy and river fish are pretty unhappy. So people, there's a great fishing in the Sudbury River but it's mostly gonna be bass and those kinds of fish. So different, different characteristics when you have a slow moving river. Um, and part of that slow movement is um, because of all the constrictions all the way down stream of you, all the bridges, uh, the Bill Ricca Dam. Um, there's just a lot of constraints on the river as it goes down and it, uh, 
that makes flooding worse upstream and it also just slows it down. And there's not that much, as there's less water going into it than should be going into it. So, so in terms of what can be done, uh, we're really focusing on building climate resiliency. Uh, a few years ago, that wasn't a watchword the way it is now, but what's wonderful is that people, uh, you don't have to explain that climate change is really happening. People get that. And the question is now, how do we protect our communities? And a lot of that is restoring and protecting the capabilities of nature uh, to manage flooding, to manage drought, uh, to manage insect pests, all of those things. If nature is made more resilient, it will be able to do those things better. And it provides tremendous services to us all. And we can, we can restore uh, wetlands and floodplains, and we can um, do all sorts of things that make it act more like a natural setting. And a lot of that can be quite modern stuff, um, you know, engineered soils, it can be all kinds of structures that are built, but we're really getting away from concrete pipes in the ground that take the water off the streets and send it to the streams and rivers. We need to recharge that water, get it back into the ground so that it can feed your wells and your water supply. Um, and these little streams, this is a picture of Hot Brook in Sudbury. It's a cold water stream. It has trout in it, wild brook trout. Um, it's fed by groundwater and that's why it's cool and clean. And we need to make sure that groundwater exists. Uh, so conserving water is, is something that everybody needs to do, whether you're on town water or whether you're on your own well, it's all the same water. Uh, and um, that's something that's being discussed a lot at the state level now of how to uh, conserve water better, uh, especially during droughts and in advance of droughts, so you get a jump on it. Um, that's for both people with private wells and public water supplies. Uh, working with aquatic uh, invasives, um, taking a sort of a whole ecosystem approach is really important. Uh, reducing emissions of, of mercury from coal fired plants in the Midwest, that was undone a few years ago, but it's now gonna be redone uh, by the current administration um, so that we can get less mercury coming down on us. And uh, looking at other contaminants of concern, which I'm gonna say a little bit about because they've been in the news and they might be interesting to you. So oh, there's our lovely little brook trout. Those look familiar to some of you. Water chestnut. Oh, oh, and the here, and now okay, I already talked about uh, migratory fish a bit, but we really would like to restore the migratory fish to our rivers. Um, and that is a discussion that's happening right now around the dam in, in the Talbot Dam in Billerica, which is the major obstacle. Harry, uh, eels, American eels can get past the dam, but the other fish cannot. So um, here are just as just a part of our map. It's an online river recreation map. It's got the trails marked on it. It's got the dams marked on it. Um, that's what these exclamation points are. Um, and it's got information for each site where you can put in a boat or you, there's a landing. Um, all sorts of information and that's online and we hope you'll use it because it's a great resource. Plus we have, we have printed ones too. If you need them, you can get them from us, from our office and we'll mail them to you. Oh yeah, there's, they're, they're the fish. They're, they get really frustrated. They get that far and then that's it. Sorry, no breeding, no nothing. You're not going to get any further. And we really would like to address that because there's a huge ecological, I'll just say one cool thing about these, about American eels is that the um, freshwater mussels, which filter our water in our rivers, need to get into the gills of these fish um, and, and herring too, I believe, in order to just for the larvae to grow to a size where they can fall off and settle and become um, attached to the rocks. And if you don't have these kinds of fish there, they can't do that. So these, are, these migratory fish are an essential part of the whole ecosystem, the aquatic ecosystem, which then of course relates to the land ecosystem because birds and frogs and everybody else, 
that um, live off of the aquatic system. So it's really, we need to restore all the missing bits uh, to, make it, to make it work and to make it resilient. I will say that we've made a lot of progress in reducing nutrient pollution. This is just, you can just see that it was, this is phosphorus in the Assabet River. It was way higher in 1998 than it is now. And that's the point, um, is that this is due to reducing the weight, the phosphorus coming out of the wastewater treatment plants. That was done with science, with advocacy, big investments by the local communities in, in good technologies for their, for their wastewater treatment. And it paid off. For example, this was Acton was going to put a pipe right into the acid bed discharging wastewater. We fought that. They ended up putting in what is sort of a, they're sand beds, but they're like a huge leach field basically. And now that wastewater, instead of going right into the river, it goes through the sand beds. It gets filtered by the soil. And by the time it gets to the river, it's cleaner and it's cooler. So that's the kind of thing that we need to be doing um, wherever we can. Oh yeah, there's, that illustrates it nicely. And just to say, I thought this was, I was so fascinated to read this. So this was in England, but they said that by investing in cleaning up the water quality, you reduce the impact of climate change, not forever, but you can, like if there would be a certain amount of damage from five years of global warming, by cleaning up the water, you're actually negating that five years. So you are making it healthier. You're making a more resilient system by cleaning up the water. So there's a really great link there um, between those, those two things. Uh, I'll say a word about fish edibility and mercury. Um, the Nyanza site is here uh, in Ashland. It just, so this bit really shouldn't be read, but that's just the mapping. Um, it discharged a huge amount of mercury and um, it went down the Sudbury River. You can see it's getting a little less bad when it's in the upper Concord and by the lower Concord, it's not as bad. But you might wonder why on earth is the acibet got mercury in it? It's still not great. It's getting like a C. And the lower conquer, you know, so what's going on there? Well, the fact is that there's mercury in all of our state's waters. And that is uh, because of, it's mainly coming from the atmosphere, uh, from the burning of coal. And because of the way the world turns and the wind moves, it ends up here, just like acid rain did in the past. Uh, but coal contains mercury. So when it's mined and then burned, uh, the mercury goes into the air and it falls here and New York State and everywhere along the way. And when it particularly problematic is when it gets into wetlands, uh, which have a different, have less oxygen in the water, uh, it gets methylated and it goes into the food chain. So in that different form, it can be picked up by aquatic life. And then it gets into all the aquatic organisms, into the fish, and then ultimately into us if we eat the fish. And that's what's happening here. So we've got the, a baseline level, which is better than it was. We remember we used to get mercury in our fillings and it was in dental waste and it was being incinerated in Massachusetts. That no longer happens, uh, but we still get some from, from, uh, from the West and we would really like that to end. Another thing I wanted to touch on is PFAS, which you may have been hearing about in the news. Some of you may know a lot about it. Some of you may not know a lot about it and be scratching your heads. But this is basically a, 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 a manufactured uh, compound that has, fluorinate, that has fluorine in it. And that's what gives it some marvelous qualities, which is that it repels water and almost everything else. It just repels beautifully. Um, and so it is used as a non-stick surface and a water repellent. So for example, Gore-Tex and Teflon um, are two common things you might be familiar with. Um, uh, what was that stuff we used to put on our sofas and, 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 um, and carpets? Uh, Scotchgard uh, is PFAS. It was used, it's also, it's a great fire suppressant. So it was used in firefighting foam, in children's, um, pajamas, uh, et cetera. 
and it is now showing up everywhere. And it's partly not that it's completely new, it's that we now can measure it because we're measuring it in nanograms per liter. And we and and just tech, you know, testing technology wasn't able to do that before. So now once we start looking, we find it. The state is very, very concerned about this and is working really hard on it. I just full credit to Mass Department of Environmental Protection and other people who've been working on this. A lot of our communities are impacted. Uh, we first learned about it in Hudson, the public water supply was contaminated. Um, and Representative Kate Hogan was spearheaded getting legislation passed to form a task force to say, figure out what should we do in this state with this problem. And they've been hearing testimony uh, basically all year. I testified in October and that was the last hearing they held. You can go online and you can listen to all the testimony and it is really something. I mean, it was very moving and really informative from the science point of view, from the human point of view. Um, I really recommend it. Anyway, um, yeah, it comes from all over the place. That's just all this really, you know, look at this graphic. This is horrible. This is thanks to DEP. They sort of put it, put it together and showed how many different ways you can pick up the stuff, whether it's just from your, you know, from your pizza box or because there was a fire or there a firefighting academy, it was in the foam. That foam is no longer being used, but it's still in the PPE that the firefighters have to put on every day. So, um, you know, it's coming, you, you use it in your household. It comes out in your your clothes washer, it's going into your septic system, and then it's going into the ground. So it's going, it's coming from a lot of places. And that's when it just makes it really, really hard to deal with. Uh, for example, here's the Sudbury River, Wild and Scenic section in Wayland. Wayland Town Well was contaminated. They're trying to figure out where from. Here's quite close by the high school. And they had an old leach field that is no longer used, but they discovered there's a lot of PFAS in it. And they thought, oh, oh that might be the source. But no, when they studied it, they found the PFAS was actually going into the river because that was the direction of the groundwater flow. And the soil doesn't take, PFAS just goes through everything. It's just amazing stuff. It doesn't stick to anything. So it's not going to get filtered out by your septic system or anybody else's or even the ground. Um, the only thing that seems to be really effective on a household level and or a municipal level is activated um, carbon filters. So that's what is being recommended and is being installed at some considerable cost. Anyway, that's just a little case of where some of it is getting into our Sudbury River. But we do know that the fish in the Sudbury River and a lot of our rivers, the Acibet and some ponds are intersex and you don't want uh, living things, mainly, who aren't supposed to be intersex to be intersex. It means it's going to affect their reproduction, but there's something going on that's making those male fish have female hormones in them. And what is it? So that's one of the things that we've been concerned about for a while. Could be PFAS, might be something else. But we do know that PFAS can have an estrogen-like activity on fish and on humans. This is rain rainbow trout in particular. Um, so this is one of the many things that's being studied. Uh, USGS and DEP just released a study they did of rivers in the state where there was a wastewater treatment plant upstream and a drinking water supply downstream. So we have Bill Ricca, the town of Bill Ricca draws all of its municipal water out of the, uh, the Concord River. They have a great treatment plant, the water is safe, but the question was, is wastewater possibly influencing the water quality in these, these water sources, these rivers that communities are drinking from? Well, here's our watershed. And yep, we've got a lot of wastewater treatment plants on the Assabet. Um, we have one that's in Marlboro that feeds into the Sudbury River through Hop Brook. Uh, and then we have some on the Concord River. And what did they find? Well, they found PFAS. Uh, coming out of the wastewater treatment plants. This is, sorry, a little blurry. This thing called Ward Brook, we know it as, as Hop Brook in Sudbury. It starts in, in Marlboro and the Marlboro Easterly plant discharges to it and then it enters the Sudbury River and then comes down near about here. So what was particularly interesting 
in the results. They studied the PFAS yeah. six are the six that are already now recently being regulated in Massachusetts. PFAS 24 is a broader group considered, some of them are considered less harmful, um, but they found um, significant levels in Assabet River. Now they're calling Hop Brook Sewage Brook. But anyway, there's a lot of names from all these streams. Anyway, I never really called Sewage Brook before, but I suppose in this case it was accurate. Um, so 20 nanograms per liter is the drinking water limit for the PFAS 6 combined. You add them all, all the concentrations of all of them up. If it's over 20 nanograms per liter, uh, it's exceeding our water quality standard. But all of these um, had levels over 50, uh, almost all of them, but certainly ours did. So that was not good. And this confusing thing is really just to show you vertically, these are the PFAS 6 and the PFAS 24. Horizontally, this is the samples taken upstream of the Westboro Wastewater Treatment Plant, which is at the headwaters of the acid So above it, there's no wastewater treatment plants discharging. That's upstream and this is downstream. What you can see is that whether you're upstream or downstream, you've got PFAS. All that changes is the proportions. And the fact that the proportions change means that yes, there's some coming out of that treatment plant as well as adding to what's already there. So that's just what that shows is that um, it's already there. It's really widely distributed in our water. Um, in Bilrica, the upstream PFAS was just above the drinking water standard, um, and but they do have good technology to remove it from their water drinking water by the time it gets to the households. So that's you know that's a kind of a marginal situation there. And on the fish consumption, uh, it's interesting to see that Michigan actually now. So I was talking about fish consumption advisories being just based on mercury. Other places it also has um, PCBs. We don't happen to have lucky not to have PCBs in our rivers here uh, in our river. Um, but Michigan, they've added PFAS in fish tissue to those fish consumption advisories. So if they did that here, it would be for both mercury and PFAS. So that's something that we're very interested in pursuing. So when we talked with the task force, we basically said that our priorities should be that that surface waters, we've been looking, we've been focused almost entirely on drinking water and waste site cleanup. And drinking water is obviously the first thing. That's what we're all drinking. But remember that fish and other aquatic life live in this water 24 seven. So they are getting higher exposure and it will be affecting them. That won't kill us but it will certainly affect the health of our ecosystem. So we would encourage, and the state will be, but we're encouraging to move quickly on, on studying the effects on surface waters and getting regulations in that affect surface waters. Um, we also, you know, the big question is where is it coming from? Uh, so that, uh, lots of, lots to study there. And then um, understanding what the impacts are and then figuring out how to get rid of it. That's the bottom line, right? How can we get less PFAS getting into our rivers? Because the, it, it flows out down the river and out to the sea. So if we stop putting it in, yes, the rivers will get cleaner. Unlike mercury, it doesn't settle to the bottom as far as we know and sit there for a long time. It, it keeps moving because that's what PFAS does. Um, so if we can stop adding it, that will be uh, that's, that's the outcome we want, right? So just winding up here, here's our river report card on our website. You can see the data there. Um, we talk about various issues. You can learn a little bit more about those. And um, that's more of our work on water chestnut, which has been quite a thing for us. Um, so if you're interested in that, we've got a really nice, document that talks all about the life cycles, where it came from, all that, the plan moving forward, et cetera, if you're interested. Um, and we encourage you to become a citizen scientist, to be involved, many ways to be involved. Um, we have great crews of people who go out and collect water samples and measurements um, and you get, we train them and they go out and they're fantastic. And that's how we get all this data that we use to talk about our rivers. 
And um, there's all kinds of other things you can do, you can communicate, write letters to the editor, all sorts of things to help people understand what makes our rivers healthy or not healthy and to do something about it and be good river stewards. So I'm gonna wind up there and um, I just wanted to thank you all for listening and for coming and for caring. Um, some of you also may be involved in river cleanups or paddling or um, citizen science and we love that. And by protecting the land, you are protecting the water. So keep doing that, it's wonderful. Um, and uh, we have had help from the Mass Environmental Trust a last plug, you could something you can do is get one of those wonderful license plates, unless you have an electric, electric vehicle, in which case you get an EV plate. But if you don't have an EV plate, get an MET license plate, because that provides what I think is the absolute best source of funding for environmental resources in the state. Um, it is what's funded a lot of our work. It funds really great work, including on endocrine disruptors and all kinds of good stuff. So if you don't have a license plate like that, get one, they're great. Um, and you know, we just work with a lot of people, lots and lots and lots of people from all our communities, um, you know, wastewater treatment plant operators to conservation administrators to nonprofits and grassroots groups. So um, we just wanna thank them all. And that's me, that's my contact. Go to our website if you want maps, if you wanna go walk along the river or, paddle down the river. And thank you so much for listening. And I hope I, I know I've gone on a long time. And so I'd love to hear from you. Um, any questions? Well, thank you, Allison. That was really fantastic. I know I learned a lot. Um, so anyone, if you have questions, please pop them into the chat here. And we've already got a question in from Charlie. Uh, you mentioned that dams are a major problem for migratory fish. And uh, once the dam is in place, is there anything that can be done to remove it or um, remediate that situation for the fish? Yes, there is. Um, so our approach to dams are, well, bottom line, a free flowing river is going to be a healthier river. So we will, we, we are interested in dam removal. But every single dam is different. They have different impacts. They have different, like some are doing absolutely no use at all. They just, they're no longer have a function. They used to, they don't anymore. Some are providing water for orchard irrigation or, you know, different reasons. If a dam has a purpose still, then that should really be considered. Is there another way to serve that purpose? Um, so maybe a dam would stay if it's still serving a really important purpose. Um, but the other thing is that um, one common misperception is that dams helps stop flooding. And in fact, our dams do not do that because they aren't managed. They're just a dam. It's not like anybody, except for the ones operated by the MWRA and the water supply system up, up there on this upper Sudbury. These dams, you don't, you don't open and close them. You can't draw them down before there's a huge rainstorm to accommodate that flood water. It's just called run of river. What goes in just goes out. And so what you have is you have a pre-filled floodplain. If you took the dam away where the water goes down, you've got a whole exposed floodplain, which will be, will not be a mud flat, by the way. It will be very quickly revegetated and, and look beautiful. Um, just go and look at any of the ones that have been removed. They look great. Uh, but when there's a ton of rain, that is now the floodplain that can fill up. And so you've actually reduced the flooding of all the properties that were upstream of that, of that dam. Plus, if the dam was in, had any potential to break, you have prevented flooding downstream as well. So there's, yeah, absolutely. We are super interested in dams being removed, but we want to do it very carefully and considering all the interests. and. Um, there's little dams, tiny dams all over the place. Those could go, uh, you know, if you, some people own a dam, they don't even know it, or they didn't mean to buy it when they bought their property, but they got it. And there's liability, you know, do you really wanna pay for liability insurance for your dam? Do you really wanna repair it? You know, maybe it's better just to take it down. And there is money out there to do that. So 
hey, if anybody's interested, you know, Dan, let us know. We're really going to be working on that kind of ecological restoration. I think so. Awesome. That's very interesting. So there are there is funding and there's programs to remove dams in Massachusetts. Absolutely, as part of the yeah. climate resiliency work, and plus anything that would help migratory fish get up rivers, uh, that there is federal money for that. Cool. All right, uh, we have a question from Tom uh, about reducing, I think I think he means phosphorus and storm water. Mm -hmm. um, is there any efforts in the Aspet Sudbury Concord watersheds to, to do that as well? Yeah, so our communities are under a stormwater permit issued by the EPA and Mass DEP called an MS4 permit um, for municipal small stormwater systems. And um, there are requirements in that over time to reduce the pollutants that are coming out of those storm drains. It's, uh, they've got a reasonably long time frame to do it because it can take that long. Um, and the municipalities wanted the time to be able to do it. So that is happening. What, we, what you probably are referring to is what's called a residual designation, which is that the EPA can say, there's a particular problem here and these particular communities need to do more. Uh, and that has been applied to a few communities uh, earlier on in the, in the Charles, that did not go well. <laughs> and now EPA can learn and they learned that they need to do way more outreach and work prior to doing that. But now they have done it for the whole Charles waters or at least the whole upper Charles. I'm not completely sure if it's upper or the whole thing, but you've seen this, there is cyanobacteria, really serious problems in the Charles and it's because of nutrient pollution. So it is possible that that kind of residual designation could happen in our watershed. We're right next door, hasn't happened yet. Um, it's a very powerful motivator to clean up stormwater, but there's so many reasons to clean up stormwater already, you know, and I think our community, so let me just mention, thank you, that we have formed, we're working on forming a Suasco uh, Climate Resiliency Coalition of, of our communities in the watershed to work on building climate resiliency. And Lincoln is a member of that. Michelle Grizenda, fantastic. She has been, um, she's part of that. And that is exactly one of the things we'll be working on is improving stormwater management and using nature-based solutions um, like green infrastructure to get that stormwater back into the ground. And if it goes back into the ground, it's not gonna be polluting our rivers and streams. So I hope that answers your question. We are working on it, yes. That's great. And if, um, if you have a follow-up, uh, just pop it into the chat, anyone. A uh, comment from Gwyn on the reminder that the, it's the same water, private wells and town water, and it's important for both water users to conserve. Um, do you have any comments on, um, I know this year we had a lot of water, a lot of rainfall. Is it still important to conserve water even though when we're surrounded by such abundant water resources this year? So one thing that we never really realized until pretty recently is we think of Massachusetts as being a wet state and we never had to worry about water. That's a Western problem, you know? But in fact, the West has these huge deep aquifers. Okay, they're draining them, they're using them up, but they're huge. We have tiny aquifers. So underground, an aquifer is just where there's, the rock is so loosely, loosely collected that it just has lots of space for water to be in it, um, or you have bedrock with big cracks. So you can store water in the ground. We actually can't do that very well around here. If you look at a map of aquifers, they're just a little one here, a little one there, a little one there. You know, and Wayland has its wells in that little one there, and you have your wells in this little one here, and there are a few ponds and lakes that are used for water. Um, you know, the, the Quabbin is fantastic because it actually captures all the rainwater. And so it's not as, as susceptible as these little aquifers that we all rely on. Um, so municipal supplies are usually little aquifers. Private wells are usually bedrock, so they go down deeper and catch water that's going through the cracks. 
But that all water, that's all going in the same place. So it's the same water. So that's one reason why if there's going to be a restriction on water use, everybody should comply. But OK, it rained a lot this year. Well, I heard 12 inches more than normal. You know, it's just huge. But that doesn't mean the next year isn't going to be dry. So this is why we need to anticipate droughts. And as soon and the state is doing a really good job of anticipating, they just don't have very good regulations once they know it's a drought, like, okay, now, like the governor said it's a drought, everybody can serve, but they don't actually, they can't make people do it very much. They're working on changing that because it shouldn't be optional. Um, when they see a drought coming and they're starting to see all the indicators showing we're getting into problems, we're getting into problems, proactive water management needs to happen very quickly. And that includes everyone. So the state's really working on this very hard right now. Uh, Master EP is proposing changes to their regulations and other things like that, and it's great. But there's a huge pushback to regulating private wells. One, it's it's hard just because there isn't like who who knows where the wells are, um, and boards of health aren't. That hasn't been something they've had to do. Um, so logistically, it's hard, but it really may be necessary. And when you see someone with a sign that says, you know, private well, don't be like totally mad at them because sometimes they have to put it up so that when the town is seeing who's using the who's irrigating with town water when they shouldn't be they know this person isn't one of those people so like that's partly just for information they may be required to put that sign up but it shouldn't be a carte blanche for for irrigation for basically non-essential water use during a drought like just no non-essential uses should happen there's lots of essential uses and those should happen. They include agriculture and you know certain things. Um, so those are it's okay. We're not going to stop that, but the other things really need to stop. And everybody needs to be on the same page, or people will be furious with each other. We saw in our watershed, we saw like you know someone's well was 400 feet deep, and their neighbor's was 600 feet deep, and the neighbor was irrigating and dried up their neighbor other neighbor's well because theirs wasn't as deep. And then they had to spend thousands of dollars to now make theirs 600 feet. You know, it was just, that shouldn't happen. And it's not good for, it's not good for peace in our communities. So we, we, we need to get better at that. That's a very interesting and good perspective too on how um, our landscape may not have the same water storage capacity. And that's why it's so important to really conserve areas that do hold the water for us in our, our watersheds. Um, so I'm gonna, I'm, we're at, at four o'clock here. I'm gonna just give another moment or two if we have any final questions in the chat um, before we close for the afternoon. Uh, it's getting dark out there. Um, and while we're waiting for any last comments, thank you, Allison. This was really wonderful presentation, very informative. Um, and I think we're all looking forward to seeing the release of that new report card. Um, and could you just remind me what the website is that um, folks should go to check? You know, the easiest thing to do is to go to the ORS website, which is just wwworz 3 numeral 3 rivers ors 3 rivers.org. And right there on the on that website, you'll see a link to go to, it's called eco report card dot. Work, I think, and there's there's the all those the Orinoco's there, the Willamette, all kinds of cool rivers are there, and including ours. Um, yeah, and that's that's where ours is, and, and it's the the update isn't live yet, but I can let you know when we're going to launch it. And, and that would be great, and we'll we'll share that with our membership and those oh, thank on you, our Bryn. email list and try and get the word out. <laughs> um, so it. one fi one final question from Virginia. Um, just about the Merrimack River, and do you have any data or sense of where they they stand? Yeah, so the Merrimack River, uh, they have the Merrimack River Watershed Council, who are the best source. They're like, you know, our sister organization. They are the best source of information. They are starting up a lot of water quality monitoring. They haven't been doing it all that long, but they've gotten some really good work going. And um, I would just recommend going to their website. And we do work with them, especially in terms of restoring migratory fish, because those fish have to get part way up the Merrimack before they get to the Concord. So we work closely with them on that. Um, 
Yeah. So that's the Merrimack River Watershed Council. And I have been, I see that, yes, this program was recorded. Uh, it's been a tricky day, what with the time change. So uh, we will, it, it takes a while to process the recording. So we'll be able to send it out uh, either Monday or Tuesday. And so if you registered for the program, you'll, you'll get it um, from Eventbrite and then we'll also share it on our LLCT e-news. Um, and have it up on our website. Uh, so I think with that, we're gonna close for the afternoon. Um, thank you again very much for a wonderful evening. Thank you everybody for joining us. Welcome. Thank you so much for all of your interest. We appreciate it. Bye-bye.